Well, I'll get right into uh, the message then. And uh, if we would turn to Leviticus 23. Our meat in due season. And we'll start in verse 1. Because we never want to forget. People have forgotten God's feast days. We don't want to forget, brethren. Leviticus 23 and verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the eternal, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is a Sabbath of the eternal in all your dwellings. For these are the feasts of the eternal, holy convocations, which you shall pro proclaim at their appointed times or their seasons. And here we are, 2023, observing first day of unleavened bread because on verse 5 he says on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover and on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the eternal seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and on the first day you shall have a holy convocation you shall do no customary work uh, on it but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the eternal uh, um, for seven uh, days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work on it. So God, through Moses, was giving Israel his plan of salvation. Even though they didn't know it spiritually, it was a physical plan for them. But as a spiritual plan for you and I, as the holy days give us understanding of God's plan of salvation. You know, we need to be thankful for these days. I was thinking back just a couple nights ago since I've been out here reading in Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong's autobiography that him and his wife kept the holy days by themselves for seven years, if I recall correctly. When he went in contact, when he was in contact with the Sardis era of God's church. They did not have that knowledge of God's holy days. God revealed those days, and yet they were God's church, but God revealed those days to Mr. Armstrong, and for seven years, they would keep those feasts by themselves. So even though they've always been God's feast, they haven't always been kept by God's people. And we have that understanding today as God worked powerfully through Mr. Armstrong to, to give us that understanding. But they spell out the, again, the, the plan of uh, salvation that really nobody else knows. God has revealed those things to us. You know, <clears throat> during the days of unleavened, prior to the days of unleavened bread, you know, we're thinking about the time coming up, wanting to get our properties cleaned, our homes, wanting to get our vehicles clean. And we're so focused on putting the leavening out. And during the days of unleavened bread, we're so focused about, you know, we can't, <laughs> you know, we can't have toast for our eggs in the morning and or a donut or, or whatever it is. And sometimes, you know, we slip up because, you know, those things uh, um, uh, we, we just do. I mean, sometimes we just forget. <clears throat> but sometimes what, it, what I'm saying is even though we work hard to de-leaven and we watch it during the days of unleavened bread, what we eat, brethren, do we only give, you know, our spiritual cleaning a second best because that's what it's about it's not about the physical it is about the spiritual it's about the cleansing of our of who we are of our very being from sin I know just a little story you know Josh uh, and my daughter uh, when they when they were just a little uh, uh, in the elementary school 
Um, my wife, during the days of unleavened bread, would fix matzos for, for Josh and Erica. And she put peanut butter and jelly on them, make it like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And so Josh would go to school and at lunch eat his matzo and peanut butter and jelly. Well, his friends were very curious what he was eating. Well, it was the days of unleavened bread, so they wanted to try a bite. And they loved it. And by the end of uh, the days of unleavened bread, my wife was packing several more <laughs> matzos with peanut butter and jelly on them for Josh's friends. They didn't know what it was, but they were good. What it was for, but it was good. They loved it. But the thing for us is that uh, we have to put our whole heart into this calling. Is there still a piece or two of leavening that is stuck in the corner of our mind that is not allowing us to go forward like maybe we want to? The title of my sermon today is The Cleansing of our spiritual house. You know, every day, but especially during the days of unleavened bread, I mean, we, let's face it, we do try harder. We, we, um, we want to please God. And so we, we want to put forth our best effort. And, but it should not only be during these days, it should be, dear God, he, uh, every day of our life. If you turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, in <clears throat> verse 1. Paul is saying here, he says, I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Our goal, brethren, should be every day, should be that we are a living sacrifice, that we present ourselves to God, a living sacrifice, something that is holy and acceptable to God. That is what ultimately, you know, we, where we want to be in our life, in our spiritual life. If you would uh, turn with me to John, please. Uh, we went over these some uh, the other night in Passover service. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 15. You know, Jesus Christ is telling his disciples, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keep them. We do our best to obey, do our best to, you know, again, love him, love the commandments of God. They give us peace and life. The rewards of keeping God's commandment are far exceeding of anything else that we could ever gain in our physical life. In verse 21 of uh, four, uh, chapter 14, and he who has my commandments and keeps him, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So, you know, Christ is saying that, you know, if you keep my commandments, you love me. You know, we, we want to please God again and, and love God, love the Father, love Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation that is being offered to us. And, and he's saying that, you know, he, any, that he who loves me or Christ, he said that, um, you know, the father will love him too. So it's, it's both. It's, uh, you know, uh, the father and our savior, Jesus Christ, that we are to love, that we are to keep his commandments. You know, this life is, is not always easy. Um, you know, we go through the difficult times and, uh, and we, we, I mean, it's, it varies so much you know, in, in our day-to-day -day life of the difficult uh, trials and tests that we go through. <clears throat> but again, Christ said in verse 17, or chapter 17 of John, chapter 17 of John, starting in verse 14, Christ 
<clears throat> final prayer, his last prayer to his father, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So the world hates us because we live the way of God. They don't understand. They, they don't uh, comprehend what this is all about. And we see in our society that it's waxing and growing worse in our times of trouble. No doubt well, can, they will uh, continue to grow. Um, but we are not to be involved in the world. You know, we have to live in the world. We have to make a living. We, we got to live our lives. But not to be involved in the practices of the world. As we know that is in Galatians, the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 and verse, uh, uh, verses 19 there. So we, again, are not to be of the world. Distance ourselves. To be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God every day. But during these days of unleavened bread, because I've been struggling a little, not, not during the days, but just a little bit in life, uh, in dealing with other people. And I look at myself and I ask, you know, how, how am I doing? Is there something that is <clears throat> holding me back? Is there a piece of that sin that is still there in me? And what I'm talking about is um, sometimes when I see people go by, if we're in the fields, and those people have offended, <clears throat> they have maliciously uh, uh, defamed us, defamation. You know, thoughts start to arise about being vengeful. <laughs> you know, well, I'd, I'd love to get back at them. <laughs> You know, I would love to, for them to go through the same thing that they have caused us to go through. But that is wrong. Have I truly forgiven them? Have I truly searched in my mind and my heart? Have I dug down in my heart to forgive them? I'd like to tell a story about a, a young man. I'm going to call his name Brett. He lived in a very, and grew up in a very dysfunctional home. He, uh, his mom would leave at about the age of 10 because of the abuse of the father. And during the course of Brett's upbringing, um, it, would be, it would be pretty brutal. He would describe his dad as a monster. But yet, he tried to please his dad. And as he grew up and he was in high school and he was at football practice and, you know, he came down afterward or, you know, he came home afterwards. His dad asked how practice went and said, yeah, it went pretty good. And, you know, I was running the ball today. And his dad asked him, well, how, many, how many guys did it take to bring you down? And he said, well, one. <laughs> Kind of snickered, dad snickered and said, well, took three to bring me down. Brett could never live up to the standards or the expectations of his dad. So the next day or the next time he went to football practice, he thought, I'm going to give it my all. Brett did. And so he did. And so he went in there and he just rammed and, you know, he's running the ball and just went with all of his might. And he went down and injured his knee. And when they went to the hospital and they diagnosed what he had, his football days were done. He was trying to please dad, and yet he himself, he injures himself. He would then learn, or they would then learn that he actually had a voice that he could sing. He was in glee club. And, well... He, uh, he had a voice, and so they sang in the glee club, and, and uh, it was unbelievable the talent that that young man had. Well, he would then graduate from college, and he would start up with a group, and they would try to 
uh, get a band going. And as they went around the country, they would invite music producers to come and watch their performance. And one individual had told him, he said, um, he said, you know, there's just something about you. He said, there's something about you that is holding you back. He said, I don't know what it is. Sometimes I see you do a great job. You know, your, your singing is unbelievable, but then I, I see you pull back. He said, what, what, is, what is holding you? And uh, Brett said, well, as he thought there for a minute, he said, my dad. And he, uh, he said, my dad, uh, my dad beat me. And he carried this with him as he was going. He, was, he couldn't let this go. So finally, Brett went home because he knew he had to somehow get this burden off of, out of his life. He had to move on with life. He went back home and saw his dad. He came in at night, and next morning when he got up, dad had breakfast, dad didn't know, dad heard him come in and get, had breakfast for him in the morning. And dad was a changing man. He was growing older and he was a changing man. And when they got to talking, you know, Dad said, well, I, I'd like to, you know, make some memories with you. And Brett said, Dad, what, what is this? What are you doing? He said, you know what my memories are? Do you, you remember when I was 10 years old, you beat me so bad that I had to lay on my stomach at night and I cried all night? That, that's the memories that I have. And the father said, well... I know. He said, I did some bad things. But the father then asked him, as he looked, as they were talking, continued to talk. He said, the, the father asked Brett, his son, if God can forgive everyone else, why can't he forgive me? And Brett said, Dad, God can forgive you. But I can't. And uh, that struck a chord with me about forgiveness. And can we forgive when we are hurt, when we go through instances in our life? Can we forgive? The other night, we just went through the greatest act of love and forgiveness ever given to mankind. And we partook of the of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. His love for us, that forgiveness, unconditional forgiveness that they gave, that he gave to us, him and the Father. But Brett could not forget his, forgive his dad. In Matthew chapter 6, I wanted to turn there first. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. As Jesus Christ was again, Sermon on the Mount. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them, or forgive men, your trespasses neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think it's pretty blatant. I think it's very black and white. That if we can't forgive... That God the Father can't forgive us. The Father can't forgive us. And with that, what is our hope? A part of this, or part of this uh, plan of salvation includes forgiveness. And we, we have to have that love and that ability to forgive. No matter what we go through, brethren, we have to forgive. Even if the other party never confesses, you know, that they've done anything wrong to you, 
even if you take it and no one and they do not say they're sorry or you know for their for what they have done it doesn't matter we have to forgive we have to forgive I like to turn to Matthew 18 because Christ really goes into gives us a parable here that Very striking. Verse 18, or chapter 18, I'd like to start in verse 21. For uh, where there two or three are gathered together in my name, you know, I am in the midst of them. And then Peter said to him, or came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive? Up seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not uh, say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, he was brought to him, who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he uh, be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. He was demanding payment be made because it was owed to him. Verse 26, the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Forgave the debt. He, he didn't ask him, he didn't put him on a time, uh, monthly, uh, uh, monthly payments. <laughs> he, uh, he forgave, forgave the debt. He absorbed that, forgave it. He moved with compassion. Verse 28, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him just a hundred denarii. You know, that's not much. You know, I guess compared to 10,000, but anyways, uh, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant uh, fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. There was no mercy or forgiveness extended to him. But he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that he, what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him and said, you know, you wicked servant, you know, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, if each of you, from his heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Very stern parable here, warning to us that as Jesus Christ came to give his life, to shed his blood, to be beaten, to be bludgeoned, to bore our sins, to bear our sins. And then we turn around and can't, and to forgive us, and for us to not to turn around and to forgive our brother, that doesn't bode well. Not only our, it's everyone. Everyone in our life. People we do business with, it's the it's the, it, you know, whether it's family members, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's an enemy. We have to forgive. That is a part of what these days are. Not only putting sin out, but a day and a time of forgiving. What did Jesus, Jesus Christ do? Let's turn to John 13. John chapter 13. Start in verse 1. We did this the other evening. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, 
that he should not depart from this world to the fa- uh, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments. He took a towel, he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you not know what I have done to you? Now, I don't see anyone being excluded here of any of the disciples. So it seems to me that Judas Iscariot, who was the one that was going to give Christ away, Jesus Christ washed his feet. We knew someone had the intention of taking our life or, or, or ratting us out or, or not, but uh, not ratting us out, but I mean um, pointing us out to those that would want to take our life, you know, how would we feel? What would we do? And of course, Jesus Christ said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to go to Romans, excuse me, let's go to Romans 12 first, please. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Paul's telling the church here, he says, repay no one evil for evil. You know, have regard for good things in sight of all men. Um, if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, you know, live peaceably with all men. You know, beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the eternal God. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will, keep, uh, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome the evil with good. There's one thing that we can be guaranteed of. God knows what goes on in our life. And he knows everything about our life. He knows those who can hurt those who do things to us. And the thing is, God says, you know, vengeance is mine. I will repay. We don't need to repay. We don't need to have a vengeful thought in our mind. And, it, and it's hard. I sit up here and say this. It's hard. But during the days of unleavened bread, we realize that we, we are stifled in our Christian life if we can't move forward in forgiving and we have to. Now in First Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 3. We'll start in verse 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted. You know, be... be Courteous, no love one another, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So, again, that's that's what we're called to. And in the big picture of life, as it is our goal and our desire to be in God's family, 
Do these things really make a difference? They honestly, they don't. Because the sun's going to come up tomorrow and things are going to go on. There are times, there are times when offenses are committed that we will have to sit down and talk with people. I mean, we just, we just can't roll over and, and let people do things to us, but we do it in a manner and in a way that is pleasing to God, and that is with love. That is with concern. It's not in a vengeance, at a revengeful attitude. We had that happen to us. We had a neighbor that had spread some rumors about us on our farm. And another neighbor came to me and told us what was being said. It would be devastating if that rumor got spread throughout the community. In the sense that, you know, if you're having money problems on your farm, you know, <laughs> that, that's not a good place to be. And we didn't. We didn't. That wasn't at all. It was just a vicious rumor because people... Whether they're jealous or mad or whatever the incense, but but we had to call them in. We had to have a talk. And I thank God that as I sat there in my chair in my office, that I said, you know what? I'm not going to jump up and down, holler, scream, cuss. I said we're going to sit here and talk. And I and I can I can tell you this: the God says vengeance is His; He will repay. I don't have to repay anything. And that's how we approached it. Those people sat there. They didn't even try to um, deny any of it. And thankfully, that was, that was good. I mean, it was a peaceful meeting, and, and uh, then we, we went about our ways. But that's how God wants us to handle situations. We have to sit down and talk with people. Do it in a loving and in a manner the way that Jesus Christ has led us. If not, if not, what's the alternative? Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the eternal. Wow. So sometimes we read this stuff and we kind of just go over it and it doesn't sink in. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the eternal. If we don't act in that kind of a manner... We might be danger of judgment. But 15, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. The root of bitterness is what happens. If forgiveness is not extended to those that maybe have offended us, and we have offended people. I mean, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I'm Mr. Clean. I know <laughs> that I, you know, I, in life, it, hey, we get up on the wrong side of the bed, we're grouchy, and our uh, tone of voice isn't good. And, <laughs> you know, you answer your wife in a tone that you think, oh, shouldn't have said that. And I even, you know, we, we try to watch how we talk, how we interact with one another because um, it uh, it reflects of who we are in James why we're this close let's turn over to James James chapter 3 James chapter 3 verse uh, verse uh, 13 um, who is wise and understanding among you let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. 
But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against truth. Because this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Where, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and everything are there. So here we are again in, instructing about the bitterness and, and the envy, the self-seeking, the self-serving, you know, uh, that, that there is, that could um, be a little bit a part of who we are, what's in us, that we are not to have that. It's not, it's not from God. It is earthly. It's demonic. And, you know, we need to... Need to rid ourselves of that kind of conduct. Sorry, I'm not used to this dry air out west. <clears throat> In the Midwest, where we have a lot of humidity, uh, but uh, it's uh, the dry air. Dry. I'm, my throat is dry, so <laughs> please excuse me. So, you know, I have talked. Uh, I've talked before about. Um, the twin girls that uh, survive Auschwitz, uh, Eva Moses Kor, and uh, she writes uh, here what it was for her. You know, it, uh, in 1995, she had met a Nazi doctor who was at Auschwitz. At the same time, she was at the same time she was at the camp as a little girl. She was in the. Uh, Auschwitz concentration camp, her and her sister, because they were twins. Dr. Mingala uh, was the doctor that did experimental uh, studies on twins at that time, back in World War II. Anyways, he had told her one of his responsibilities was signing the collective death certificates for those who died in the gas chamber. There were no names, just the number who had died in each successive gassing sad. He said the twin experimentation was top secret and he knew nothing about it. But when she had asked him about how the gas chambers operated, he replied, this is the nightmare I live with every day of my life. She asked him to go to Auschwitz with her and sign a declaration about what he told her. He did. He relented and he did. There must have been a little humanity left in the guy. And after she returned to her current home there in Indiana, she pondered how to thank him. For 10 months, she wondered how to send a thank you gift to a Nazi. And even she even visited a, a Hallmark store and futilely looked at the thank you cards for more than several hours. How do, you th how do you think a Nazi? I do not know, Cor, uh, Eva said. Then she said it popped into her head. She would write him a letter of forgiveness. I discovered that I had one power left in my life. I could forgive the Nazi for what, the Nazis for what they did to me. It took her four months to write that letter. But she goes on to write, I felt much such freedom. She said, I was no longer a tragic prisoner. I was free of Auschwitz, and I was free of Dr. Mengele. Forgiveness is the seed of peace, she writes. But she freely admits it took her five decades, five decades, that she was bitter for what happened to her. She wanted to seek revenge and, and put and, and, and make those who, who did those awful things to her suffer the way that she had suffered. And so she said, you know, I, I would have had that 50 years of my life if she would have given, forgiven, you know, back, way back when. Took her a while to learn that. Forgive, see the miracles that can happen. 
the thing is, as we think that we want to get revenge, in all honesty, if we do, would get revenge in some way, it's still not going to take away the pain that has been caused. It's still within us. So that's why revenge and being vengeful is not the answer. Being unforgiving isn't the answer. It's being set free by the fact that we forgive and we love one another. And God teaches us that. Jesus Christ set us that example. We really need to search ourselves, me included. <laughs> and that's why I'm giving this today, because I'm asking myself, I'm asking myself, you know, do I extend that forgiveness that has been complete and unconditional forgiveness that has been extended to me by Jesus Christ and God our Father? We need to ask God to reveal our own way, you know, reveal the things, you know, that are wrong with us. In Psalms 19, let's turn to Psalms 19. Psalms chapter 19, verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults, David would say. He'd ask God, cleanse me from my secret faults. Go through these days of unleavened bread, brethren. That's what this is about, is a cleansing. That we look to God and we ask God to please show us who we are. And those secret things that might be stifling our Christian life of moving forward. That we can see them and, and with God's help, <clears throat> get them under control. Being unable maybe to forgive, there is a cause for that. And that is, is pride. No, pride is, a, is an awful thing, brethren. Uh, it's all about self. It's all about me. And as we look at Proverbs, Proverbs chap, chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 16. These six things the eternal hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. Number one, a proud look. Right off the bat, pride. Pride, brethren. Because I think we can say that all sin, all the roads of sin lead to pride. In Ezekiel 28, I'd like to read where all this stems from, as we know. Chapter 28. We'll start in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Eternal came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Eternal. Of the eternal God. You know, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. You know, God dressed him up in, you know, wonderful and beautiful things. The sardis, topaz, diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, sapphire, the turquoise, emerald with gold. You know, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, what was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You know, you were anointed, cherub, who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. 
or in the stars. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until or till iniquity or lawlessness was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. And what was it? Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So here it is that God created such a beautiful angel, Lucifer. That there were so many things that, that he could have done, could have used for good. And yet, there came that point in time. And we don't know how all this happens. It, it's for the human mind to try to comprehend it. You know, it's hard. We just have to take God's word and, and trust it. But he, he was lifted up because of his beauty. He had that pride. That's where it all stems from. The headwaters of pride, where it starts, right here. And that's why God hates it. Because pride is sin. And God is not going to tolerate sin. Sin will not be in the kingdom of God. It is going to be burned up. It is going to be eradicated. It is going to be, the earth is going to be cleansed in the universe of all sin. It's not going to be. Our inability, brethren, as human beings, is our, for, no, it's, it's our inability to forgive. And even though a person like Eva forgave you know, it's a physical forgiveness, and, and that's good. That, that's good that that can happen. But yet, to go further, the spiritual forgiveness, that, that only comes from God and through his spirit. That we can love as God loves and forgive as God forgives and put it behind us. You know, humanity... It, they get hurt when we're, someone might say something to them. You know, it's our self-esteem. You know, our self-worth might be uh, badgered, damaged. You know, our self-importance is where pride is. We're not important. <laughs> we're replaceable. But we wanted to be is to put on Jesus Christ in all humility and love. Our ego, I'm sure we've all, all talked about people with egos. Man, how does he get through that door with that big head? You know, thinks he's pretty good. It's all about him. It's all about the self-importance, and that's not God. It's about the way of life of give. It's about selflessness. It's about serving Even the apostles, it just came to mind. I don't know if I can, just real quick. Um, uh, brought it up, now I... Um, yeah, I, I won't, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I just happened to think about it. You know, there was a time when with the apostles were with Christ, when... They were kind of arguing among, or few, you know, having a little tip between themselves who would be the greatest. Right. Not going to who, who's going to be the greatest. It's who's that, it is that person who's going to serve, who's going to have love and compassion, who's going to go out of his way to help, who's going to take from his own and to give to others. That's the way that God works. That's who God is. And that's who we are to emulate. Proverbs. Let's go back to Proverbs. Quick. Proverbs chapter 8. Again, a little bit about pride. <clears throat> Pride. 
8.13. The fear of the eternal is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Again, God, he says, I, I hate this. You know, who are you? Where were you when I created the heavens and the earth? Where, where were you when I, you know, put the sun in the sky for the day, moon and the stars for the night? A little old man, a human nature, a pride and arrogance, thinking that we're something special. God says it's evil, and we are to get rid of it. It has no part of being, again, a servant wanting to help others. Again, it is all about self. Also, let's just turn over a couple, two or three pages, of chapter 13 of Proverbs in verse 10. You know, by pride comes nothing but strife. But with the well-advised is wisdom. And it does, pride. Because it puts you before everybody else. And it, it just causes strife. You know, I'll be honest with you, you know, you don't want to be around it. See a prideful individual, I just, hey, walk off to the side or whatever. You know, don't, that's not who we are. First Corinthians chapter 5. Start in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, start in verse 1. Here it is, you know, the church puffed up, full of pride. It's actually uh, reported that there is sexual immor uh, immorality among you, and, su and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's uh, wife, and you are puffed up. You, know, you're, you have vanity, you have this, this pride about it. And, uh, and have not rather mourned. I mean, we, they didn't see it as something that was evil. That he who has done this de deed might be taken away from among you. Where he says, for indeed as absent in body but present in spirit have already judged. You know, I've already judged as though I were present. Him who has, no, uh, him who has done so, so done this deed. I'm sorry. So in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, let him be out of the church, put him out of the church, and hopefully they come to in their ways, their senses, and see the air of their ways. And that they would, you know, come back. You know, repent and come back and, and be a part of the body of Christ. But he says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. <laughs> you know, you do not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Therefore, porch out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So, uh, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with our old ways, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, and, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Brethren, we are to keep God's feast here this week, starting today, in sincerity and truth, the days of unleavened bread. Strive again to put out sin, those things that <clears throat> stifle growth, growth, spiritual growth. Pride, pride prevents us from moving forward. It is that thing that, that holds us back. In Proverbs, uh, let's go back to uh, verse 16. Pro or, yeah. Proverbs.
Proverbs chapter, <laughs> in tongue tied here, 16, chapter 16, verse 18. You know, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It is better to be a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Boy, I've, I've seen that, you know, of, of that kind of pride that, again, puts themselves above others. Have, have a fall. Pride goes before destruction. It will ultimately take you down. And we know in our spiritual life, our spiritual journey, that pride will not be, again, in, in us. Uh, I mean, we, it, it will be eradicated from our life or we cannot be a part of the kingdom of God. Again, it's God's spirit that helps us. That's why Christ went to the Father. He said, that's why I go away so that, you know, the helper, God's spirit, they would send God's spirit back so that we could overcome the very things that trouble us, the very things that stifle us. Mark chapter 7. Oh, Mark chapter 7. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 22. Verse 22. Or verse 21. For when out of the heart of, man, of men proceed evil thoughts, adulterous fornication, uh, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. You see where pride is at? <coughs> It's in that group of the works of the flesh. And that works of the flesh, again, um, we, we, have to, we have to get out of our lives. We've got to put out of our lives. For all these, thing, for all these evil things come from within and defile a man. Turn to 1 John. First John chapter two. Verse sixteen, chapter two of first John, verse sixteen. For all that is in the world, you know, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the or the flesh, the lust of the flesh, <laughs> and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world, brethren, is passing away, and the lust of it. But who? But he who does the will of God, he abides forever. These things are going to be gone. We see the days approaching. I think Mr. Nelson had said it, maybe, or, but anyways, is, is the things that are going on in this world, and time is short, <clears throat> brethren, we have to knuckle down. We've got we to bear down and get it done. Get our lives in order. Because God's kingdom is going to be here soon. God can't work with a prideful person. Pride stands in the way of our relationship with God. Then what is God looking for? How? we move forward in our life. Well, it's very simple. God tells us what he's looking for in Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Verse 1. You know, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made. You know, <laughs> People want to build God. God owns everything. God doesn't need a house. He, the earth, or the, uh, the universe is his. For all these things my hand has made, and all these things exist, says the eternal. But what doesn't exist? <laughs> really, if you look at it, as he says all these things exist, 
But on this one will I look on him who is a who is poor and a contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. That is who God's looking for. Someone full of humility, someone that is teachable. You know, all these other things exist, but this, <laughs> you know, in us. And this is what we have to develop. This is a part of the character that we are developing. To be full of humility. God can work with that. Because we're willing to do whatever God asks. He doesn't have to, you know, beg or, or, or spank us or, or whatever. It's something that we want to do. We want to please God. We want to become like him. We want to be teachable. We want to respect his word. To tremble at it. That is who God is looking for. That is the person who is a living sacrifice every day. That kind of person. There is no sin in humility. It's about esteeming others before ourselves. You know, God doesn't want sacrifice. You know, he's always wanted a heart that, that he could work with. A people that he could trust. People that would love him as much as he loved them. A people that would interact with him in his holy and righteous commandments, in his laws, and those things. That's what God's looking for. And brethren, that's where we need to be. That's where we ultimately need to land. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 16, Romans, oops, Romans chapter 12, 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. No, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. You know, do not be wise in your own opinion. You know, God doesn't want us to be out here uh, flaunting anything or... or it's about dwelling together in harmony and unity, in humility. That no one is trying to, to jump over anybody else. No one is trying to get ahead of anybody else. No one's trying to climb a ladder and, you know, to get above anybody else. We are to be humble. Associate with the humble. You know, there's some places where we just, have you ever been in a place where you just don't fit in? You know, and I'm, I'm a simple guy. I'm, I, I, you, you guys all know I'm just an old farm boy. That's all I am. And, you know, we don't fit in with the high and the mighty. Why does, why does God call us? He calls the weak and the base things because he's going to show the mighty what he can do with the weak and the base. We fit in together as people whose goal is God's kingdom, who are humble, who love God, who loves his truth. Someone who's not looking to be greater than anyone else, but again, one who wants to serve. Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, verse, verse 11. 
For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself, he will be exalted. It is plain. Jesus Christ plainly states that he will humble those who want to exalt themselves. He will be, but he who, um, again, is a true servant and humbles himself, he will be exalted. And not that this is our purpose to be exalted. It's, it's not. If we're here for, for something, if, if, if we give something because we want to get something back, then that gift really isn't. If we are giving to help someone without expecting anything in return, that is God what, what we're here for. Not to gain anything, but to give. You know, during, again, the, the days of unleavened bread here, the hard work, again, isn't cleaning our homes as much as it is cleaning ourselves. That's the hardest part. Physical things are, can be simple. You know, we can make those things happen, right? We can work extra hours. We can do whatever we need to do or get equipment and do whatever we, you know, need to do. But it's not that way with us. We have to work on ourselves. But we can't, we know we can't do it alone. And, and Jesus Christ and the Father knows we can't do it alone. Again, that's why he went. He had to go. He had to serve as our high priest so that he could return. Or the, they could send their spirit to help us fight the battles that we fight in the flesh and put on God's spiritual uh, armor. And, you know, we can use the trials in our test uh, for our growth. Uh, we look at Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> Verse 8. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. I hope that we can see that the trials that are set before us, they can be advantageous to us in our spiritual growth. When Christ talks about the vine and pruning the vine, those are acts of pruning when trials do come our way. They are there for us to grow, to develop that character. They are not for negativity. They are not to, to be down about. They are for us to look at it and say, where can I go? What can I do with this to become a better person? How can I become a better person? By the things that are <laughs> in our daily life that we go through. And if that's a person that offends us, forgive. It's the hardest thing, though, the human nature, not wanting to forgive. And I talked about the story of, of Brett there and his dad. <clears throat> when Brett said that he could not forgive his father, it was such a toxic relationship. The bruises, the cuts ran so deep. He was scarred from all the mental and the physical abuse that he just couldn't forgive his dad. Brett would run out of the house. He, he said, why did I bother coming back? And he ran out of the house he went to jump on the motorcycle that he came there with. It wouldn't start. He went out to his dad's truck to jump in it so that he could leave. There wasn't any keys in the ignition. Pulls down the sun visor looking for keys. What did he find? He found that his uh, dad was dying 
of pancreatic cancer. So he went back in the house and asked his dad, Dad, are you dying? And he said, yes. He said, I ain't dying. Brett then went up to the attic where his mother dropped him off when he was 10 years old as she was leaving. As she was re uh, leaving the relationship. Dropped him off at a church camp. And Brett there, at one evening at the camp, um, the youth director, uh, they were going to talk about forgiveness. Now, he was just 10 years old. And so they had a journal that they were handed out, they passed out for the kids so that they could journal their, their time there at the youth camp. Tonight, the youth director said, I want you to write down who it is that you will forgive. Brett Markton is saying, tonight I forgive, and he left it blank. He, uh, now, as his dad was dying, he went up into the attic, found his journal, opened it, and there it was. A blank. Who will I forgive? And Brett would write dad in there. He could finally forgive his dad. He wanted to reconcile before dad died. He realized that how futile that life can be. And he wanted to forgive. Brett went on then to great things in the band that in which they uh, performed in, him and his friends. They went on to even make some a number one hit there. The band that Brett, and that was not his real name, or it actually was his name, went on and make or to uh, create the band Mercy Me. I don't know if you've ever heard or not, but anyways, that's who this young man was. Again, as we say, time is uh, passing by. We want to make sure that, brethren, we can dig deep inside that and, and ask God to show us those secret things that it might be hindering, you know, our very spiritual uh, journey and yeah, maybe even our eternal salvation. They've got to be gone. They've got to be eradicated. And these days of unleavened bread is a part of that, that cleansing of our spiritual house. Hope you have a good. For more information, go to our website at cogassembly.org. Copyright 2023. Church of God Assembly, all rights reserved.